So, in today's video, we are once again going to do a comparison between the official and unofficial translations for My Hero Academia, while also comparing the relationships that Deku has with his fellow classmates in Class 1A that we see in this chapter, and how they have affected Deku, and how Deku has affected them. And we'll get right into that, right after this intro. <laughs> Hey guys, how's it going? It is your boy, Manga Mandrew, and I'm here to talk to you about My Hero Academia, Manga Chapter 320. And when it came to this chapter with the differences in translations, there is actually a lot to talk about in this chapter, not only with how things are translated, but how it affects the meaning of what the characters are saying. And that is something interesting, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently this time around. Instead of just talking about the difference in translations first and then getting more into the discussion later, I'm going to splice in the discussion of Deku and how he has affected his other classmates and vice versa with the differences between translations between the official and unofficial translations because there's just a lot to do for this video and I'd like to see if I can condense it a little bit more with this strategy. So hopefully it goes well. And if you like My Hero Academia discussions, spoilers, and reviews, this is the channel for you. So if those things are something that you're interested in, subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit that notification bell to be notified for whenever I upload. And without the way, let's get right into the discussion. So let's start off with talking about the differences that I first saw in this chapter, particularly when it comes to what Bakugo says to Deku. Because in the unofficial translation, Bakugo brings up that they all know that Deku unlocked the fourth to the sixth user's quirks, and that is what is stated in the unofficial translation. But in the official translation, he specifically says that Deku unlocked the fourth and the sixth quirk. And that is a little bit different because it comes with a wider scope of exactly what the students know or what the students knew before they confronted Deku. Because it makes sense for them to now know about the fourth and sixth user's quirk through Bakugo, but they also could understand what Deku's other quirks were before they knew those because of what happened during the Paranormal Liberation War arc. Where we as the readers know that he unlocked both Float and Danger Sense, but the students would only know that he had Black Whip and Float because those were the only two that they could have visibly seen. So it makes sense for Bakugo to specifically reference the fourth and the sixth user because those were the two quirks that they had no idea about until Bakugo most likely told the other students about them. Which is why in the next page, some people are surprised about the smoke screen, but Uraraka was not. And when it comes to, uh, this chapter when it comes to uh, a lot of the main characters that have really strong ties to Deku, such as Ida, Bakugo, and Uraraka, they actually do not do a whole lot in this chapter. With the exception of Bakugo, who's trash talking Deku, but if anything, that's less about their connection and more of Deku not falling for Bakugo's insults to try and push him to attack him, which would give Bakugo the chance to put him down and trying to keep him in one area and distracted so the other classmates can come up with the plan that they came up with to try and rescue and stop him. And so uh, from there, there isn't a whole lot of differences in translations up until we get to the part where Ojiro confronts Deku, but there is a few interactions that we see between Deku and other members of Class 1A. And when it comes to Koda, we do not see anything in the story that directly ties him to Deku, but what is very impactful about this moment is the fact that Koda is even speaking to Deku, because at the beginning of the story, Koda wasn't this type of individual that was able to uh, speak freely with others in the same vein as Deku, and he was very shy and nervous, which is very funny because his power involves him having to speak to other animals to control them. But the fact that Koda is not only the first one to go into action, but is also the first one to speak, shows most likely how much development, or specifically how much growth, Koda has come through that Koda has gone through throughout the entire story, and that's probably something that Deku realizes, because he also probably realizes that 
it is completely different from the coda that he knew at the beginning of the story to the coda that he knew now to take the initiative to try and convince him to stay. And then going from Coda, we actually cut over to Saro, who we actually have had more moments with him and Deku than we have had with Coda, as well as the person that we'll get to later. Because we have Saro, who brings up how Black Whip is a little bit freaky and a little bit scary as he's pulling on Deku, but then he also has a memory of how he was helping uh, Deku train. And this memory slash flashback isn't something that we directly see, but is most likely referencing to the moment where he unlocks Float, where Deku asks Sero, Froppy, and Uraraka to help him learn how to possibly like use his uh, black whip in a more effective way, as well as to kind of be the surrogate to understanding and kind of getting the gist of how to move in the air when he inevitably unlocks Float. So this isn't something that we've seen, but it shows that Sero has had an interaction and has had a connection with Deku through training. And even with that, we've also seen Sero in the story also connect with Deku in other training situations, such as the provisional license exam, where he and Uraraka were next to Deku when they all gained uh, entry to get into the second stage of the provisional license exam, as well as it was Sero who won the match against Deku when Deku was finally able to show his entire class how he's able to use full Cowley. Deku did lose to Sero in that match, but it was very cool to see how they were able to interact with each other and how they were on friendly terms with each other, showing that they were truly friends. And then going from Sero, we actually get to see Ajiro, who also isn't as prevalent in the story when it comes to her connection with Deku, but there was a strong moment that Deku had with her, and it was during the cultural festival. And as we see in this chapter, Jiro is explaining how Deku did something very minimal by helping her organize her notes and how that was something that was very impactful to her. And this is very important because this was all during the cultural festival where Jiro was afraid to express her hobbies of music because she thought that everyone would think that it would be pointless, but because Deku took the initiative to help her, she was very thankful for that and realized that her hobby could actually be used for the benefit of someone else and could have a connection with being a hero, which is what she wanted. So in that vein, Deku did play a role in allowing for Jiro to have a better understanding of herself and what she wants to be as a hero and being able to tie that into her hobby of music, which explains why she's also here trying to bring Deku back because of that close relationship that they built in that moment. And then we get to Ojiro. And ironically enough, I think Ojiro probably has, among everyone that we've talked about right now, the greatest connection to Deku, or at least had the earliest connection to Deku in the story of My Hero Academia with the obvious exceptions of Ida, Bakugo, Uraraka, and all of them. And I mainly bring this up because Ojiro also brings up what happened to Deku when he was fighting against Shinzo, and how he said that he would never forget the instance that Deku got mad for him during that fight. And that is something interesting if you go back and reread the chapters surrounding Deku's fight with Shinzo. Because from what we see in that fight, the reasoning why Deku got mad may not necessarily be just because Shinzo called Ojiro horrible names like monkey and stupid. Because there's a flashback in that exact same chapter where Ojiro tells Deku about Shinzo's ability, but towards the end of that flashback, we see Ojiro basically confront Deku and ask him to win the fight for him. So if you put that into context for why Deku reacted that way, and what we see later on with Shoto, he wasn't necessarily wanting to win this fight for himself, but potentially to win the fight for Ojiro because he asked him. And then when Shinzo started to insult Ojiro in front of Deku, Deku reacted more harshly because it wasn't just him in the fight, he was also doing it for Ojiro. And as we've seen with Deku, he's willing to put his own self and his own pride on the line and on the side if it means helping out someone else. And because in this instance, he was also trying to help Ojiro, 
and Shinzo was trying to prevent that and was chastising him about Ojiro, he was un Deku was unable to hold his emotions and accidentally spoke out, which almost led to his defeat. So with that in mind, this connection that Ojiro has with Deku is very important to Ojiro because it showed how much Deku cared for him, even though they had only been classmates for a few months. And that's why Ojiro is so determined to help Deku, just because of how impactful that single moment was on him. Now, going from Ojiro and his explanation for why he has a connection with Deku, we actually get to the next difference in translation between the official and unofficial translations. And it primarily involves Deku's explanation for why he had to leave because in the unofficial translation, he says that he had to leave because All For One is going to take him away. But in the official translations, he says that he can't let All For One take you all away from me. And this is very important because it ties into the idea that Deku is doing all of this in a way to protect his friends and that he thought that the best way to protect them is to separate himself from them so that All For One doesn't have a chance to go after them. So when it comes to how impactful this line is, it's more impactful in the official translation because it directly ties to the ideals for why Deku is doing this in the first place. But then we get into a moment with uh, Sato as he has saved Jiro and Ojiro as Tokoyami has blasted Deku into the building with his dark shadow. We just have Sato just bring up like a small moment about how if Deku doesn't return back to UA, then he won't allow for Deku to use his red food dye to make candy apples for Aerie. And even though Deku says that someone else could do that, it's very important to realize that uh, when it comes to uh, Sato's indirect relationship with Eri as well as Deku, that the reason why Deku was really able to see Eri smile and give her an amazing time at the festival is because he went out to get the ingredients to make a candied apple, but he didn't have the dye for it. So instead, Deku got that dye from Sato. And this is very important because it means that Sato played a role and Deku making Eri smile. And the fact that Sato was able to eventually meet Eri in the Christmas like sort of kind of chapter, yeah, Deku is very important to Sato and vice versa through Eri, who they all know had a troubling past. So we also get a, it's a small interaction that doesn't really get a screen time of Sato actually doing it, but the implications for what he did is something that is directly tied to a major point in this story when it comes to Aerie and her quirk and her relationship with Deku. So it's amazing to see that as well. And then we probably get to the weakest relationship in this entire chapter. And it's most likely the relationship between Deku and Momo, because in this line where uh, Momo basically has this machine that straps Deku to the wall and tries to put him to sleep, she doesn't really give like a personal antidote for how uh, she and Deku are friends or to that extent. And she just explains to Deku as well as to the readers how they're able to use their quirks through, through their connection with the Endeavor Agency as well as their mission to save him as a whole. So Momo doesn't have a specific reasoning for doing it nor a real connection with Deku. But you could say that her wanting to save Deku could just be the general want to help everyone because she is the VP president of class 1A if you forgot about that. So it just makes sense that it doesn't matter if it was Deku or someone else that she would have done the exact same thing because she is the vice president and that she cares for all of her classmates easily. Also, you know, she was also a part of that group that went out to save Bakugo. So that just inherently ties her together with Deku because they just did something very, very illegal. And now going from the relationship that Momo doesn't really have a whole lot with Deku, we actually get to Kaminari, which it's even more ironic because Kaminari may have had less interactions with Deku as a whole, but through his explanation to Deku about being friends, he says that, yeah, we don't really have a whole lot in common, but I still think of you as a friend. Also, you know, take a bath. So it's very interesting to see that because we don't really see a whole lot of Kaminari and Deku interacting at all in the story. But even with that one moment, it shows that even though we don't see it, Kaminari still viewed Deku as a friend. And even though he realizes that they don't really have anything in common, he still appreciates just Deku being there. So it may not be big, but it shows that every classmate at the very least has this innate desire to rescue Deku because they are his friend and because they want to be heroes. 
it just makes sense for heroes to go and rescue their friends. So it's not really a big relationship that Kaminari has with Deku, but all the relationship that he needs to have with Deku is being a friend, which is why he's doing all of this to try and help him. And then we get to another difference when it comes to the translations from the official and unofficial translations. And this isn't really that big of a deal. It mainly has to do with how the uh, unofficial translations just translate it on a weekly basis, while the official translation can translate based off references to prior work. And I'm specifically going to talk about Shoji and what he says to Deku involving uh, his connection with him. Because here, Shoji, who's able to wrap Deku in the insulation uh, tape made by Momo, Shoji brings up an old reference line that Deku makes during the attack on the training camp arc. And the difference isn't really that, is very minuscule. The difference between the actual translations and small is just what they are specifically referencing that is important because in the unofficial translation, the line that Shoji says is the exact same line that Deku says when he's describing how with Shoji's hearing, with uh, Tokuyami's uh, black dark shadow power, with uh, Shoto's fire, as well as him himself, that they would make a team that would even scare All Might. And that is exactly what he is stating in this chapter and how he appreciates how Deku viewed him in that same vein with all of them but in the unofficial translation it is more of them saying that uh they are scared of all might which doesn't make sense because he's a hero and why would you be afraid of all might when he's just this beacon of hope and a ray of light i would understand if it was endeavor but it doesn't make sense for them to actually be scared of all might but it makes more sense for them to scare All Might, as in, if they all work together, they could have potentially taken him out. So yeah, it's very slight, but it shows that those words really had an impact on Shoji, which once again explains why he's here to try and bring Deku back. And speaking of Tokoyami, we actually get to see his connection and his explanation for why he's wanting to help Deku, and it's actually in reference to how Deku chose him for the sports festival and what Tokoyami says is that because of Deku he was able to realize that Dark Shadow could be used as a defense which is why he used Ragnarok Room and what is very interesting is that if you go back and you actually read uh, where this panel comes from and the chapter where Tokoyami is revealed to be a part of the cavalry battle with Deku you'll realize that when it comes to Deku choosing Tokoyami that his combat ability wasn't what Deku was looking at it was his defensive capability, specifically when we see the scene of him blocking Ojiro's attack and how Black Shadow or Dark Shadow is able to look around the vicinity to be like eyes and ears as a fifth member. As well as Deku brings up the idea that it is a mid range like fighting ability, Deku never really saw Dark Shadow or Tokoyami as actually physically fighting someone or even as we see later on actually using him to take the headbands off someone else's forehead that Deku really just thought of Tokoyami's Dark Shadow as defense which is in contrast to what Tokoyami has always used with Dark Shadow which is attack up until his internship with Hawks where he used it to be able to fly. So this shows that Deku had a great influence on Tokoyami, not just on his personality, but being a friend, but also how he's effectively able to be a hero for both defense and offense when most likely Tokoyami probably would have only focused on offense. Because of Deku's words, he is now able to use it for defense, which is how he was able to create Ragnarok Woo. And there's one thing that I want to bring up. We see that Shoji brings up this idea that Deku is viewing them as victims who needs protection and coddling. And in reality, that's kind of true because we once again get to another difference in translation where Deku breaks out of the uh, Ragnarok womb and he's flying away and how in the uh, official translation, and we'll actually get to that uh, a little bit more, in the official translation, he brings up the idea about how glad that they're worried about him, that he's actually worried about them deep inside, but the and that the fact that he knows that danger sense isn't going off because he doesn't sense any danger or malice, it means that they are trying to help him, but in the unofficial translation, it has no mentions for danger sense. He brings up the idea that they aren't a danger to him, but that it doesn't bring up the idea that Danger Sense is actually working in the unofficial translation. And that is a major difference because it means that Danger Sense 
in its essence only senses danger when there is like actual real danger or malice intent being that technically the class one a students can go full force at deku but because they're not doing it to like specifically hurt him but to save him deku would be unable to dodge those attacks through danger sense because danger sense doesn't sense the mallet so most likely what we're getting an explanation for when it comes to danger sense is that it's only able to sense danger with malice intent and this could tie into the theory of the traitor because if the traitor accidentally decides to want to hurt deku in this moment and danger sense goes off then we could potentially know who the traitor is but the reason why i bring this up in reference to uh shoji's comment is that in reality deku is treating them as if they are people that need to be protected, as if they are victims in this uh, war and how they seem to need protection, but he fails to realize that they, like him, also want to be heroes. They also understand the danger of wanting to be a hero in this world, which is why they want to be by Deku's side. They don't want him to carry the burden on his own because they also want to carry the burden as well because like Deku, they also want to be heroes. And we get more of that confirmation when it comes to the difference in translations as well as the connection that Froppy and Shoto have towards Deku towards the end of the chapter. Now, getting into the final differences for this chapter as well as the final uh, relationship that we primarily see in this chapter between Shoto and Froppy, uh, there is a few difference in translations as well as a few differences with the clarity of what the characters are saying in this chapter towards the end. When it comes to Shoto, uh, there's a lot that you can say about Shoto and his relationship with Deku. And when it comes to the differences in translations, it is pretty much like the same when it comes to what he is saying for both the official and unofficial translations about how the burden that Deku is carrying does not allow him to feel sadness or to cry and that he should share that burden with everyone else. But when it comes to Shoto's connection with Deku, oh, where should I be? Again with this uh, should we talk about how Deku basically told him that his power is his uh, should we go with the fact about how De uh, Shoto was able to help Deku fight off stain uh, should we talk about the fact that uh, Shoto was there when he tried to rescue Bakugo as well as with uh, Momo Ida and Kirishima uh, should we also talk about the fact that Deku knows about uh, Shoto's home life and his interaction and his hatred with his father. There's so much to say about Shoto and Deku that I'm not gonna say all of it because it's just so much, but also because I just listed it. But yeah, there's a reason why Shoto is here. Uh, Deku has basically changed him for the better into who the person that he is. So yeah, obviously he's gonna be here to fight. But the main difference in translation actually comes from Suyu and her connection with Deku as well. Because when it comes to what Suyu says, in the unofficial translation, she brings up the idea that uh, when he is scared and when he is trembling and when he sheds tears, that is what makes him become a hero like in the comics and how they won't let him go alone. Which is kind of weird when you bring that up, in, especially in the unofficial translations, but it is made more clear in the official translation because instead of her saying that the crying and the shedding of tears makes you a hero, she says that when Deku cries, they cry. When they feel fear, they will all feel fear. And when it comes to Deku wanting to be a hero like in the comics or to be this dream of being a hero, that class A will follow him to that dream, that they will also take that dream upon themselves because they also want to be heroes. So the official translation makes a whole lot of sense with that because Suyu is just saying that whatever happens to you, whatever you want to do, will always be there by your side because we're your friends and because we're heroes. So it makes more sense in the official translation than in the unofficial translation. But then you also have Suyu bringing up the idea about how she's not going to cry anymore and this is very impactful especially when i went to go and look this up in the chapter because what she's making reference to is the aftermath of the kamino ward incident after all might retired after a all for one got defeated how she is crying about the fact about how she tried to convince them to uh, not go and how by them going to Kamino Ward that they're basically villains and how that really impacted her emotionally and how she thought that Deku, that Kirishima, that Momo, that Ida wouldn't want to be friends with her anymore and that just made her sad. But 
it is concluded with the fact that it's fine, that it's okay, that they can start over and that they're, that they hate it, that they made her feel that way. So they went to comfort her in her time of need because Suyu isn't the type of person to really speak her mind and ask for help. And this is very impactful because this is pretty much what Deku is doing, but the opposite. Deku is normally someone who speaks his mind, but he's hiding the fact that he's feeling pain, that he is afraid. And now the students are trying to comfort him, but he doesn't want that. But it is something that he needs. So there is a parallel between the situation that happened with Suyu and how the students were willing to help and cheer her up in the same vein as Deku is in pain and he's not showing his emotions, but the class 1A, the students are still there to help them. And it could be because of this situation that they had with Suyu for why they're doing this. So it shows that there is this theme and this understanding of class 1A being more than just classmates, they're friends, they care for each other, even through the harshest of times, they are willing to forgive and forget. And the fact that Tsuyu at the end of this chapter brings it up and she went through something very similar, is just even more impactful, especially if you go back and reread that chapter. So yeah, that is the reason why Asui is here, Tsuyu is here, because she has gone through what Deku is going through right now, but she also knows that it's fine that it is okay because she knows that class 1A, her classmates will be there for her. So she wants to be there for Deku the same way Deku and all of them were there for her. So that is her connection with Deku and why she wants to help save him and bring him back. So yeah, that's pretty much all the connections that I really saw in this chapter as well as the major differences between the official and unofficial translations for this chapter and this was a lot to cover and with this in mind I may not be able to make another video like this for a while but most likely what I see going down next chapter is that we're gonna get pretty much a repeat of what we saw in this chapter but with the other half of the class 1A students because we pretty much saw the first half or one half of the classmates in this chapter and most likely we're going to see the other half of the classmates in the next chapter and them trying to explain to Deku what's going on why they're there their connection with him of uh, most likely we're going to see Ochako, Ida, Bakugo have their case towards Deku and they may be the ones that completely break down Deku's like wall to allow them to come in and help them especially Ororaka who could be the potential love interest of Deku as well as her goal of being the hero that saves the other heroes. So it just so it would just make sense if Uraraka would be the one to put the nail in the coffin that completely saves that completely saves Deku. And that's something that I can explain how that could happen later on in a different video, but how it will connect to not only her goal, but her feelings towards Deku and could lead to Deku potentially finally giving up and allowing them to take him back to UA where he can finally take a bath. So yeah, that's all I really have to say about this chapter. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this chapter. Hopefully you enjoyed this discussion. Uh, did you think that there were any other major differences in this chapter in comparison to the official and unofficial translations? And let me ask you, which character do you think had the best relationship with Deku in this chapter? Was it Ojiro? Was it Froppy? Was it Shoto? Leave your thoughts down in the comments down below. I would love to get your opinions on that. So yeah, leave a comment down below. Leave a like on this video if you liked it. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you like this type of content and hit that notification bell to be notified for whenever I upload more videos. Do all that cool jazz and hopefully I'll be able to catch you in my next video. Goodbye! <laughs>